This is Get Real with Deb Waterbury, a show where Dr. Deb gets real as she teaches through books and studies on topics relevant for today. And now, here is your host, Dr. Deb Waterbury. Welcome to our next episode of Get Real with Deb Waterbury. We are in the middle of our, it's a three-part series on my Painted Window Trilogy, and so we're right smack in the middle, lesson five on book one, which is Painted Window. If you haven't gotten that book yet, you can go to debwaterbury.com and get that book. The Bible study that goes along with this video series is in the book. Uh, for those of you who have been with me the last few weeks, I'm sure you already have it. This um, the story of Elizabeth has really reached its climax this week as we get into our, our message. And, and this one's called Painted Window. This week is called literally Painted Window because in this part, we read the namesake for the entire series, why it's even called that. You know, what, what this, this week is really about guilt. Uh, it, it's about the thing, the one thing, I believe, that keeps most of us from living in the truth of who we are in Christ. And you know, the truth of the matter is that when you live in this kind of guilt, whenever it is, guilt is the thing that keeps you from accepting a love that's already yours, you haven't really laid hold of the gospel. The, the gospel has, is, is something that maybe is some words to you or whatever, but you haven't laid hold of the, the true meaning of what occurred on the cross of Calvary and what occurred for you and in you and, and with you when you accepted Jesus as your Savior from the gospel. So we are going to spend this time in the gospel this time. We're going to talk about truly what happened at the cross and, and what God did for us. But, I, you know, I want to point out that it is guilt. And, and Elizabeth in the story at this point is literally immobilized by guilt. You know, guilt is, is the perversion of a pierced conscience. Understand that we all should have our consciences pricked whenever we do wrong. My conscience is still pricked over my past, but I don't live under conviction of that. I mean, condemnation of that. I live in conviction that I don't want to ever do that again. And I remember it because it makes me ever more aware of the beauty of what I have now. But you don't live in condemnation. Guilt would be when you move into guilt, you move into a perversion of that conscience that should rightfully be pierced. And, and guilt is the thing that immobilizes you. Guilt is the thing that puts blinders in front of you. Guilt is the thing that keeps you from that which is yours. And so in the story, when we're here with Elizabeth, what we know is she has um, gotten arrested for supposedly stealing Contessa's bracelet. And we know she didn't do that, but she's been thrown in jail. And Mary, her friend, finds out, runs and finds King Reginald. King Reginald beats feet, gets down to the jailhouse, and he's going to make sure she is released. Things are in motion. She won't be able to be released to the next morning. So so he visits her at the jail jail cell. Now, when you're when you get the then that's the reason why this cover looks like it does. We really created that to to represent this is a, the jail window that she's looking out of. So she's in this really dark, dank jail cell, and there's one window, and the window has been painted over. It's black, and she is looking out of this window, though she can't see. And she's longing for what she w wish was true from King Reginald, just longing for that. Well, on the other side of that window is Reginald, and he's adoring her, but she can't see him because she's looking through this painted window. Now, the painted window in this entire series is the allegorical representation of guilt and the sin of the guilt over our sin that keeps us from seeing that which is right there. So she's, she is living in this guilt of, of feeling that she doesn't deserve it, but wanting it so badly. And there he is on the other side of the window. He doesn't move. He's loving her like crazy from the other side. She simply can't see it. The painted window is your guilt. The painted window is the thing that is keeping you from seeing that which is already there. And that's the sadness, isn't it? When you're reading this, and I know I have so many friends, when they've read this, they get so frustrated with Elizabeth because they're like, you're so dumb. This, the king loves you. Why are you not accepting that the king loves loves you because it seems so plain to you and I because we can see that he loves her and he's standing right there but she can't see it and and you just almost seems like she's in rebellion to her own to the own her own reality and we get frustrated but the truth is we do the same thing we do the exact same thing when we think we're not worthy of 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 this love that we have and the truth is we're not <laughs> we're not worthy of it neither was she she wasn't royalty before any of this she was you know a peasant who had had a really sordid past just like the rest of us in some measure or another it is it, it she is not worthy but the king doesn't see any of that he loves her 
And, and just like our King, Jesus Christ, chose and loves us, not because of us or in spite of us, but because of Him, <laughs> because of His great love and His great character. And so we are at this place right now in Painted Window. And you know, I, and because of that, I know that, that what keeps us from seeing that, what kept me from seeing it for so many years, which keeps a lot of my clients from seeing it right now, many of the women that I minister to and counsel from seeing it, is this, this lack of knowledge of what the gospel really is. So for, I want to go over the gospel with you. And, and you know, a lot of you are going to be like, nah, I know that, and you're going to tune out. Please don't do that. Because what you, what you know is you know kind of what happened, but do you know what was done for you? Do you understand the depth of what was done? Because I think if we did, we wouldn't be living behind a painted window. We would be literally feeling the love, peace, joy, contentment, and harmony that should constitute all of our lives. The, um, and so I want to go over that. We're going we're gonna to be looking at Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 26, which, you know, I've said before, Romans, greatest letter ever written, according to John Piper, and I agree with him wholeheartedly. This letter has the gospel in it from beginning to end. But if you ever want to just have it laying out before you, Romans 3, cha chapter 3, verses 21 to 26, tell you the gospel. So we're going to talk about those verses just briefly this morning to to give you the, the reminder of what was done so that you don't live in condemnation from your past. You don't, you don't live in this, this perversion of a pierced conscience, which is guilt, which then makes you stand behind a painted window when Jesus is right there. So, you know, I, I love, and this, these little verses here are, are profound, and, and I'm not the only one who thinks so. Um, it was uh, Martin Luther who wrote, you know, he wrote this very famous Greek translation of the New Testament. And in the margin of his translation, this is what he wrote about these verses. He said, Romans 3, 20 through 26 is the chief point and the very central place of the epistle and of the whole Bible. So literally he's saying these verses we're about to read is like the pivotal point for the entire Bible. And he's right because it is the gospel. So those are what I want to look at here. Romans 3, 21. And actually I'm just going to go to probably the first part of 25. I'll be reading from the English Standard Version if you'd like to read along with me. But if not, just listen close. It'll be up on the screen anyone. Anyway, so Romans 3, 21. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ is for all who believe. For there is no distinction for all of sin to fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. So I stopped there at the first 25a. So uh, there's a couple of things I want to talk to you about in terms of these verses. And the first thing is literally the proclamation of the gospel, which happens in verse 21. Again, verse 21 says, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. So what he's basically saying is proclaiming. This is the gospel, the righteousness from God. Now that means, you know, righteousness is something we don't have, but what God requires, he gave us through Jesus. So the righteousness Righteousness of God, and it, it was being told throughout the entire Old Testament. It was proclaimed from the law and the prophets, basically saying from the very beginning, the law and the prophets were talking about this from the very first promise of the gospel, and it was uttered immediately. The very first promise of the gospel was uttered in Genesis. Immediately, right after the fall, God pronounced the gospel was coming. It was Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where he said, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. He's talking about Satan and Jesus right there. He's saying, right now, I'm already going to tell you the gospel is coming. The gospel is coming to fruition. From that moment until the final prophecy of the Old Testament, which was in the book of Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, chapter 4, verses 2 through 3. So from the first Genesis 3 to the last book in the Old Testament, Malachi 4. But for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness shall rise with healing in his wings. You shall go out hopping, leaping, I'm sorry, leaping like calves from the stall and you shall tread down the wicked for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. Again, beginning to says Jesus is coming. Last, last verse, last book, last proclamation in the Old Testament. Jesus is coming and this is what he's going to do. There's only been one gospel. 
There's only ever been one gospel, one plan. There's not plan A and plan B. There's plan A, A, A. <laughs> and it was always from the beginning until the fruition of Jesus, one gospel. And it was apart from the law. This verse tells us that it was, the, you know, the law was created but it was really the law was created to show us that we needed the gospel. It was created apart from the law. So when, when he undertook to manifest his righteousness for our justification, he did that apart from the law. That's, that is, he didn't direct our, direct our attention back to the law and all of its sacrifices. That wasn't the point of the gospel. He directed our attention to his son, whom he sent for our sins. That was so when the gospel came to fruition, Jesus didn't say, okay, so you guys need to go back to that law and really obey that law. He, he, he did it apart from that. Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 3, verses 21 to 22, is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin, so that the promise by faith in Christ Jesus might be given to those who believe. So the law, all the law did was tell you how sinful you were. It didn't give you freedom. As a matter of fact, there was bondage. Because you try to, the more you try to, and you know this, the more you try to follow the law, the more you realize how bad you are. You can't do it. So it was apart from the law. Romans 8, 3 puts it like this. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned the sin in the flesh. So he, everything was always pointing to the gospel. There was always one gospel, one Jesus Christ. The law was never meant to be it. The law was to point you to the knowledge that you couldn't do it, <laughs> that somebody else had to do it for you, and it had to be Jesus. The second thing that you see from these verses is that it's a gift. You're not worthy. You can't earn it. It's a gift. You know, when somebody gives you a gift, they don't expect anything in return. You can't give them anything in return because it's a gift. It's something they've given from themselves. And it was, and what Jesus said is, I mean, what God said here and what Paul said through, God said through Paul was that it was a gift to anybody who believed in Jesus. For all who believed. It said faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. The plan to, dis to display God's righteousness, which was always going to be in Jesus Christ, is available to anybody who believes in Him. And there's no exceptions. He said, I'll sin. <laughs> he said, there's no, anybody who believes on Jesus. There's not a sinner that's so bad, his belief in Jesus won't then accept that gift or give him that gift. All have sin. What Paul's saying here is no exceptions. Anybody who believes on Jesus Christ, from the worst to the best, those people will receive. And you know, I love J.C. Ryle put it this way, because he did a, you know, the, whole, the opposites thing. He said, every son and daughter of Adam is a great sinner in the sight of God. There's no exception. It is the common disease of the whole family of Adam in every quarter of the globe, from the king on the throne to the beggar by the roadside, from the Lord in his, the landlord in his hall to the laborer in his cottage, from the fine lady in her drawing room to the humblest maidservant in the kitchen, from the clergyman in the pulpit to the little child in Sunday school, we are all by nature guilty in the sight of God. So. It, what we say is that everybody sinned, and then Paul, therefore, is saying in 20, verse 23, all of you have sinned, and you're exchanging, therefore, the glory, lacking the glory of God, and therefore dishonoring the glory of God. We all have done that. But, and so that, that's the problem, isn't it? How can any of us, because we are that, expect to have this? And that's why the answer lies in verse 24. Verse 24 says that we're all justified, and we are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, the gift of righteousness given by God, and that grace for redemption through Jesus Christ is given to all who believe in Jesus as the Son of God, no matter who they are, because sin is sin is sin is sin, and we all do it. So it is free, a free gift to all of us. And, and, and the third point here is that it's a propitiation. Now, I want you to understand what the propitiation, what propitiation means. It, it, is, it is the actual giving to replace something else. So uh, the, this verse here is about the replacement of our gift, I mean, of our guilt. God put forward His own Son, Jesus Christ, as a propitiation for our sin, as a place taker. 
as, as something that replaces our sin. Paul's really clarifying here what he'd already said that Jesus had done as our ransom and our redemption. It's like he's building up to this crescendo, you know, that this is it, man, he's our propitiation. So redemption speaks of a purchasing back something that we, that we were in bondage, like the prisoner of a war or a slave, which Jesus most assuredly did on the cross. However, Paul brings it even clearer and using the word propitiation. Propitiation literally means wrath removing sacrifice. Literally means that Jesus became the sacrifice that removed the wrath that was should be ours from us. There, you know, when when Jesus stepped up on that cross willingly and died terribly, what he did was take the place for the wrath that you and I deserve. When we live in the guilt and the condemnation from that guilt of things we've done, and then don't accept the fullness of what was given to us and done for us, we're really looking at Jesus and saying that what he did wasn't quite enough, that I am too bad of a sinner. My sin is better than your sacrifice. That's really what we're saying. I know that's not what you mean to say. I know that's not the heart of what you're saying, but, but by virtue of the fact that you think you're that bad of a sinner or that what you've done is just so bad Jesus can't have done, you've literally looked at the Lord of Lord, the, ho the Lord of hosts, the King of Kings, and said, yeah, you're not quite good enough <laughs> to, to wash over my bad. And, and that, is, that's, that is hubris. That is thinking that you're more than you are, even in the worst part of that. Jesus is King. He's Lord. He is part of the Trinity. He's part of the Godhead. His wrath removing sacrifice was certainly enough to remove the wrath that should have gone on you and then any sin that you've committed can be washed away. So in terms of that, when we live, and I, and I never want you to think that you shouldn't remember where you were because you should always remember what used to be, but you don't live there. You remember it because it makes you appreciate what he did for you, but you don't live in the condemnation of that because remembering it, when it moves into that, that's when it becomes that perversion of a pierced conscience. Your pierced conscience should remain. You should never be okay about your sin. You should never be looking back at your sin going, yeah, whatever, that's not a big deal. That Jesus' wrath removing sacrifice didn't remove the truth of your sin and didn't remove the reality of what you were saved from. And we should remember that always. But we don't live under that condemnation. Paul says in Romans 8, chapter, chapter 8, verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He's moved all the way through this and said, you deserve all this wrath, but it's been removed by the propitiation of Jesus Christ, that wrath-removing sacrifice that was done for you so that you remember it. But now because of that, because you are in Jesus Christ, there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because there's, and in that no condemnation, there should be no painted window. There should be no window. That should be a clear window you're looking through and seeing all the love that comes from your Savior. Otherwise, we're living in a deception, a thing that isn't true. Elizabeth in our story is caught in that. And we get frustrated when we read it. It's like, girl, the king loves you. Just open the darn window. You know, that's what we're thinking. But then we, think about yourself and how, how easily it is for you to do the same thing. Brothers and sisters, I pray that we look past what the enemy would have us do, which is focus on the condemnation of what we should have received and instead focus on the gift of what we did receive. Amen? So I pray that you'll continue with us. Again, if you haven't got the book, debwaterbury.com, you can get that book. You can get all three if you want to. It's actually cheaper if you get the trilogy altogether. We will be doing the other two books eventually, but for right now in book one. Pray you'll have a good week. I'm looking forward to finishing this up with you in the next couple of weeks. God bless you, and I'll see you next time. Thank you for joining me today on this episode of Get Real with Deb Waterbury. I hope you were blessed and I hope you got some information that's going to help you get through your day. If you want any more information on any of my books or my articles or on any of my future speaking engagements, you can find all that information at debwaterbury.com. God bless you.